Krishna. Welcome to the presentation, the original Shadi.com, revealing the treasures of happy relationships. Some devotees think that it's a waste of time to learn about male female psychology and relationships from the Bhagavatam. You had a conversation between Kadama Muni and Devahuti. Then that was being narrated by Maitreya and Vidura. That was being narrated by Sukhada Goswami and Raj Friction, which was being narrated by Suta Goswami to the name sages of Namashwanya. So if just learning about male female psychology and relationships from Bhagavatam is a waste of time, why do we have so many Maha Bhagavats? commenting about it, and on top of that, we have Prabhupada himself, who is descended from the spiritual world, and given almost three chapters worth of commentary on this section. That means Prabhupada wants us to pay attention. Dharma Sunishtita Pumsam Vishwasena Katasuya Nopadayada Yadi Vatim Shama Eva Hikabalam That our particular duties according to our nature. If they do not invoke attraction to hear about the pleasure and, and messages of the Lord, they're basically useless. So if someone's in a marriage and it's not actually provoking attraction for listening to Christian messages, according to Bhagavatam, it's useless labor. Nowadays we have so much divorce. Prabhupada didn't want divorce. Prabhupada didn't want to see or to see broken relationships. Prabhupada did not want children to grow up in broken families. He didn't want to see uh, hearts broken. Atakumbi Dujasreshta Vanashram Vibhagasha. Swanushtitasya Dharmasya Samsiri Haritoshna. That if the highest perfection or the highest thing that can be attained by performing one's occupational duties is actually that which helps to uh, invoke the enthusiasm to hear about the messages of Krishna. So that means marriage, Grahashta Ashram, if it's done properly can actually allow someone to reach the highest perfection. <coughs> so we're going to look at three main areas today. The first is Sambandha, or what, some, what are some of the factors that can contribute to having a happy relationship. Next is Abhideya, the particular types of duties or processes within the relationship. And then finally, Prayodhya, the results of, happy, of having happy relationships or good, having a good, healthy relationship. So, the first Sanskrit word or phrase I want to introduce you to is this found in Canto 3, chapter 21, verse 15. Samana Shilam. Samana Shilam basically means that a male and a female, the idea is that they match and they have a sense of like disposition, a sense of similar attitude, and they're actually compatible. It's like this. What ingredients are needed to bake a cake? Someone tell me some ingredients that are needed to bake a cake. Flour. Sugar. sugar baking powder. Baking powder. Ghee. Ghee. Essence. Yeah. Alongside that is particular utensils also. So, you give those particular ingredients to a cook, they'll bake you a cake, no problem. So like disposition is like that. It means that the male and female have the particular ingredients that are necessary to have a good relationship. Does that make sense? Yeah. There's the ingredients that are in place in order to have a good relationship. So what are they? Prabhupada talks about that the uh, that there should be a matching in character 
and a match in taste. So what does proper mean? Can somebody read out just this purple from Bhagavatam, please? That is the art of conveying a man and woman. Men and women should not be united simply on the consideration of sex life. There are many other considerations, especially character and taste. If the taste and character different differ between the men and women, their combination will be unhappy. At the present moment, because boys and girls are not married according to quality and character, most marriages are unhappy and there is a ghost. That's from Canto 3, chapter 24, verse 15. Prabhupada also uses a term called Swajati, which I think he also quotes, Rupa Goswami uses the similar term. Swajati means that uh, mutual interests. So the idea <laughs> of what Prabhupada is bringing out is that friendships, relationships, should be cemented <coughs> with people who have similar interests. Similar values, similar moods. Because why? Because when you have the psychological conditions are matching, they're equal, they're harmonious, then there's less chance for misunderstanding and more chance for a sense of happiness. So think about it. You're, gonna, you're about to live with somebody for the next 30 years. There has to be some understanding. Because you wake up and one person's got one idea of how clean the house is, another person's got a different idea of how clean the house is, they've got different interests in spiritual life, mm. different spiritual strengths. It may cause some misunderstanding. What happens is this if there's not a match in their minds, of the male or female, then the wife con competes with the husband, and the husband competes with the wife. And what happens? There is a sense of lack of respect, a sense of lack of understanding. You get into all types of arguments, and they just both basically drag each other down. Now, there's also a, another consideration to why the natures between the male and the female should be equal, should be equal matching. According to the Manusamita, if there's a differences in matching, it can actually result in different natured children. So we won't go through all of this, but just to highlight a few, you have, let's say if the father is a Brahmin and the mother is a shudra, that can result in having a child which is an ishada, which is a particular type of alcohol is considered. Or if you switch them around, you have the mother is a shudra and the father is a brahmin. If the natures don't mix, you can actually get a chandala or dog cooker, someone who cooks dogs. Now you mix those two, a chandala and an ishada, you get someone called an antya vasai which basically means untouchable of the untouchables. <laughs> See the point? So this is just an extra consideration with why you want to have similar natured partners because it can result in similar, similar natured children and that increases the understanding between the parent and the child. So you can write a whole book on how these chapters can be misused. No problem. One of the ways it could be misused, somebody can <coughs> look at Prabhupada's purports and say, well, our horoscopes match. Therefore, we don't need to do anything. Our horoscopes match. It's not a problem. We don't need to put any effort into the relationship. Now, for some of the ingredients that you mentioned about how to bake a cake, if you give those ingredients to somebody who can't cook, Will you get a nice cake? Yeah. So alongside the ingredients to make a good cake, there also has to be the correct knowledge and effort put into the endeavour for there to be some good result. Otherwise just ingredients or just effort 
without the combination of both, doesn't work. Does it make sense? So, depicted here is Kadama Muni and him actually having Darshan of Vishnu. So, it goes something like this. We are actually brought into what seems to be a contradiction. The contradiction is that you have Kardama Muni who's been meditating for 10,000 years who really wants to be spiritually enlightened and inclined and he gets Darshan of Vishnu on Garuda and then he prays for a while. So what's going on here? Shukadev Goswami addresses this point in Canto 2, chapter 3, verse 10, well before we get even to this chapter. He mentions a karma sarva karma vra, moksha karma udharadi, to reign a bhakti yogena, yajeta purusha param. That a karma, even if somebody has no material desires, or sarva karma, even a person has desires for a wife, for a car, for a house, for a holiday, or moksha karma, somebody has the desire to be free from suffering. Still, each and every person should actually intensely worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead, regardless of their, their number of desires, material desires they have. So, you have the Lord being in the heart of the devotee. He expresses that Actually, Kadama Muni, I knew what was in your heart anyway. I knew what was there before you prayed. And I'll make arrangements for a, a suitable match, a suitable wife. She'll visit you two days from now, just after you complete your sadhana, your meditation, your austerities like that. And then, as we'll see, it'll gradually unfold. So, this brings up another point also. That we should depend on the Supreme Lord in every transaction of our material existence. Why? Because He can make arrangements beyond our imagination. He can make arrangements beyond our imagination. You have, there's a story given in Canto 1, chapter 15, verse 7. The Swayamva ceremony with Draupadi. So you had a king named King Drupada who owns a mansion or a palace. And he wants to get his daughter married. So what does he do? He makes arrangements by gathering all the different princes who wish to uh, marry or wed Draupadi. And there was a lot of them. Draupadi was beautiful, she was trained, she had a good background, you name it, he was there. So Drishtya Jumna, who was Draupadi's brother, gathered the different princes to this ceremony. Drupada makes the challenge. He says different, to the different warriors, you need to hit this fish that are suspended from the ceiling of my palace. Not only that, you need to hit this fish even though it's protected by a chaturo. And not only that, you need to hit this fish in the eye. And <laughs> you thought that was bad. You're actually not allowed to look at the target. He mentioned that the way you need to hit the fish is by using the reflection of, a wa of the water within the water pot that are put on the floor, and then you take your shot. So, that knocks down all the princes to only two people who can take a shot. Arjuna, and a personality named Karna. <coughs> so, Draupadi sees this and she actually starts panicking. She runs to her father. She said, Father, I am not marrying anybody less than a Kshatriya. Karna happened to be the son of a carpenter. So he was a Shudra. He wasn't allowed to take the shot. So Arjuna, looking at the target through the reflection of the water pot, aims his bow and arrow up, takes the shot, and actually has, and is awarded <coughs> with his hand in marriage. 
When Krishna left Arjuna's association, he was lamenting. And he makes the point that if it wasn't for you, Krishna, I wouldn't actually have been able to get the hand of Draupadi. Because after he took the shot, it wasn't over. All the princes decided to rush Arjuna. They thought, forget this, we're going to have him. So Krishna helps Arjuna, and Arjuna was able to defeat all the different uh, princes who rush after Arjuna. So there's two things we can draw out. One is that in order to have somebody who's qualified, in order to attract a qualified woman, one should be qualified themselves. The second is that when Krishna's on your side, he can arrange the best of the best. So Krishna is the best matchmaker. He's your best Gahashta Ashram counselor. Like that. He can arrange the best of the best. Now So you have Devahuti's father, Manu, Swamiguru Manu. He arrives at the habitat or uh, home of Kardama Muni. He says, Kardama Muni, we need a man-to-man -man talk. Something's on my mind. I've got a, my daughter who's unmarried. She needs to be married and she's looking at you. I found out that you're actually qualified to marry her. She will serve you to her heart's content. She will, she's fixed her mind on you. And she's happy to marry you. No problem, we can make the arrangements. And you'll actually be stupid not to take her. So uh, Manu builds up his arguments to prepare for the marriage. So now, he mentions a point. He says uh, he's looking for Vayaha Shila Gunabdami. He's looking for Vyaha, somebody who is of an equal maturity level. Uh, Shila means somebody of equal character, and then Guna, somebody of equal qualities, so that the match can be actually made. So now, what's going on here? You have the emperor of the world, rich as anything, as powerful as anything, he has as much influence as you can imagine. Daughter must be rich, and he's offering her to a hermit who's living in a cottage made of dried leaves. You know, who's going to pay the bills? You know, what's going on here? The point is this <coughs> no matter how qualified you are, the idea is that. Character is more important than just the amount of wealth and riches and assets that you have. That, was, that is what was considered in the Vedic system. And now, just to show you just how qualified um, David Guti was, I'm going to show you one last thing from the, one last uh, reference from Manu Sunita. According to the Vedic system, there are actually eight kinds of marriage. And I'm not going to address them all, but I'll sh show you some of the popular... I'll just talk a little bit about one of the most popular ones that we see. So, you have the Gandhava marriage. Gandhava marriage means uh, marriage that's invoked just from physical attraction, sexual attraction, love at first sight, all these types of terms. You know, met on a radio station, five minutes later, we made the... <laughs> we got married, you know. it was just like that. So, Drought, uh, Devahuti actually prefers the best type of marriage. So you can't read that so much, it's called a Brahma marriage. So that means Devahuti is extremely trained. Because Devahuti is happy to allow her father to make the arrangements for a successful marriage. She must be trained. So we're not dealing with just an ordinary person here. We're dealing with a woman who's very highly qualified, highly trained.
Okay. We're launching a direct attack. When I land in London, which will be I think, on Sunday, the next Tuesday we're planning to give a seminar in the universities. It's Valentine's week. So you have, nowadays you have, the, everything's pink in London. You have adverts about Valentine's gifts, people wanting to find a new partner or find a new freshness in a partner. We're launching a direct attack. We're launching an attack on all the types of misconceptions about relationships. See, you have some women who think themselves to be very beautiful, which is actually not a problem. That's not a problem. But in thinking that, what happens is they assume that because I'm beautiful, I therefore, the only consideration of a partner is that he is as sexy as me. He is as beautiful as me. He is as handsome as me. He's rich. And he should just be able to, uh, you know, fulfill any of my desires at any time, no problem. Has anybody here met a woman so beautiful that she almost made someone fall out of a plane? <laughs> no? Anybody? Come close? You had Deva Hooti, who was so beautiful, it's like she was standing on the top of this MI building, bouncing the ball, and an Emirates flag flies across and, you know, basically it starts, you know, wobbling because, it's, you know, she's just that beautiful. So no one can claim that they're as beautiful as David Hooty. But what does she do? She goes through this process of actually choosing a person of good character, good qualities. Does that make sense? Now, you may have some of the men saying, you know, honey, I told you, Michael told me last week that you shouldn't, you shouldn't be looking at my money, or my wallet, or my bank balance. It's just all about my character. But actually, Kadama Muni, he himself qualified himself. He made sure that he was appropriate to receive a good match. Fair? So then now, we'll move on to Abidel. The particular, uh, just the some of the essential activities between a male and a female. So I'll start with the male. The first uh, thing that Kadama Muni demonstrates is sense control. Sense control means that the senses serve him, he doesn't serve the senses. Make sense? This actually, more than almost more than anyone is important for me. Why? Because I don't come from a Krishna conscious background. I don't come from a pious background. I don't come from a selfless background. So it means that these pages of Bhagavatam are important for me. They're important for my training and it's important that by following this particular process that's demonstrated by Kadama Muni we can actually move towards actually trying to be qualified. The second point is this. Kadama Muni is sensitive. David Huti <coughs> means he's not lazy. He's able to fulfill the desires of David Huti. And he's not passive. He's not neutral. He's not impersonal, he's not just holding back and expecting things to happen. He actually uh, endeavours himself to satisfy and make sure David Hoot is happy. For the female. There's actually a particular shloka that encapsulates the different activities that a female can do to Control her man with love. Not out of exploitation, but out of love. And it's given in Canto 3, chapter 23, verse 2. Vishwapena ma shaochena, goravena tabena cha. Shushushaya sarvidena, vacha mudaraya chabo. So, Vishwapena ma shaochena, Devahuti demonstrates that she was serving Kadamamuni with purity of mind. 
with intimacy and great respect, Gauravena. The main cha, with control of the senses. Shushushaya, service, with saravidena, grid, with the heart. And then vacha, maduraya, chabo, with sweet words. <coughs> you do the opposite, it's going to have some really inauspicious effects. Harsh words, uh, envious service, it's not going to work. So now, sometimes you may read, you know, that the wife should be submissive, this and that. Submissive wife does not mean that she's exploited. This side, this is his son. Yeah. This side, this is her son. It's not that he's like, oh, you know, you know, you should be talking to me with more sweet words. You should, what's, where's, where's my service? And then she's like, you're supposed to be sense control, what's the matter with you? You know, you, should, you need to be increasing your sensitivity, what's going on ahead? The idea is that we all have our particular development areas, fine. Bhagavatam recognises <coughs> the particular development areas for each uh, gender. But, it's not a licence to exploit your partner. If the man exploits the woman, the woman exploits the man out of attachment rather than trying to share for service, they open up a gateway to help. There's a, another fine point, and that is to be Krishna conscious. So, who better to learn about how to be Krishna conscious than Krishna himself? And he gives some of the key principles. The Brahma. Given in the Chattva Shloki Bhagavatam, which is Canto 2, Chapter 9, verses 33 to 36. <coughs> so what does he mention? I'll summarize the Chattva Shloki in four lines. The first is that Krishna is within everything and outside of everything, or beyond everything. That means Krishna can be, uh, that means one can be Krishna conscious anywhere. He can be Krishna conscious anywhere. The second is that whatever appears to be of value, if that's not connected to Krishna, it's Maya. So whether you value, you know, like your furniture, your mobile phone, your wife, hopefully, your husband, we want to be trying to see that connection to Krishna. Third is Beyond the material, beyond the material sphere, me, Krishna, I am actually a person. So, it's not that we just have a relationship mechanically, but rather we're trying to put our heart and devotion into seeing the Krishna factor, seeing where Krishna is coming through in the relationship in the ashram. And then Chattasloki number four, is in all times, places and circumstances you should actually be looking for me Krishna declares that so the Gohartha Ashram is like an adventure it's like some people used to play Mario he had all these different types of obstacles and he had a goal in mind so the Gohartha Ashram, our goal we know is Prem and that Ashram is a particular medium whereby we can really try to see Krishna coming through in a different aspects and different um, elements of it So, a final point, or final section, and that is Prajna, or what's considered to be some of the results of having a healthy relationship. So, what happened is, uh, Kadama Muni was able to, let's say, after exercising sensitivity, or after being shown very sort of love, affection and care. He protected David Hooti in a few different ways. One of the ways is by giving her facilities. And at the end or the result of their relationship, alongside nine daughters, is that they actually had a 
what Prabhupada describes a ray of Vishnu or a ray of the Supreme Personality of Godhead entering to the room of Devahuti. And then after granting Devahuti, giving her satisfaction and a sense of fearlessness, fearlessness through the sun, he was able to happily take up sannyas and carry on, while she continued to make spiritual advancement in her. The uh, contrary, what we've seen is that if the consciousness between the partners are not sufficiently prepared in a Krishna conscious way, then what can result is actually giving birth to demoniac children. In the case of Kashyap, Kashyap Muni and Diti, you had Kashyap who was very inclined to sexual, uh, sexual enjoyment, and Diti who wished out children to somewhat compete with, the, with her sisters who had children before already. And that resulted in children like Hiranya, which means gold, and Kashyapu, which is like soft bed. So the elements of sexual enjoyment and prestige combine in that manner. Now there's a further point. Never mind in having demoniac children, sexual enjoyment can cause all sorts of issues. And I'll play a video just to highlight that. training I've received since birth. I also grew up in a Krishna conscious background, like I was saying before. So that means these chapters are especially important, not just to prepare for the Grahashta Ashram, if that's the case that may be, but just in general interactions and dealings with devotees to ensure that they are based on selflessness and Krishna rather than selfishness. See, Prabhupada wanted a society of leaders, general spiritual leaders, Genuine spiritual leaders. He wanted that Krishna consciousness takes over the world through re-spiritualization of human civilization. He wanted to create a cultural revolution. And it's not that he wanted to invite people to the Krishna conscious movement and they come and see all types of broken relationships. We'll just put them off and they'll leave the organization. So Men, we want to attract a David Huti, but we don't just want to be a Kashyap Muni standard. 
And in conclusion, Prabhupada says that the SIP's mission of ISKCON is to bring the members closer to each other, to show and teach a simpler and more natural way of life. And on that note, I'll open up for any questions. In the video, yeah, <clears throat> you had this male who has a particular condition called persistent sexual arousal syndrome. He has up to 100 orgasms a day, un unmotivated. So throughout his daily life, he could be given a presentation, has an orgasm, and he's on the floor going crazy. He could be showering and he's going crazy. He could be given a lecture, writing an exam, speaking to his wife. Uh, he said he mentioned that he was at a funeral of his father's. He was saying prayers, orgasm. <laughs> so, this is not even a spiritual argument. This is a psychological, physical, social argument. That if somebody's inclined to sexual enjoyment, that's what it can cause. And Krishna can give it to anybody immediately. It's not a problem for him. Because he's in control. So that's an additional way, or additional impetus, to actually make sure that we strictly follow uh, the principles that Prabhupada outlines. Not just because Prabhupada said it, but because actually it could have <coughs> damaging, <laughs> damaging effects. Is that, is that okay? Is that clear about the Kanaga Rafa Group? Any other questions? No, I'm just like, um, there are Buddhi and the Kandavamuni is like a well, good mansion, but nowadays there is no such. We don't know that, but, but what to do if something happen like without knowing each other, but we have to live together. So what we what we can what we, what we can adapt, what we can include in our life. Okay, good question. Thank you. So then, you're going to help me bring out a few extra points that I couldn't include in my presentation. You do the best that you can. Just to highlight, just to give some emphasis to it, so I'm my, and my answer to that. <clears throat> Even one time in a guru call, somebody else bucked a video Puna Swami. You know, if you have if you haven't performed Garbhadan Samskar then and you perform it later, after the birth of a child, then what? And within the uh, section of the Bhagavatam we were reading, it talked about how Garbhadan Samskar helps to bring crow, uh, swans for birth. And without Garbhadan Samskar, we just give birth to crows. So he mentioned that by performing Garbhadan Samskar after birth, you know, if you didn't perform it before birth, given birth, you become a pleasant crow. <laughs> See the point? So, fine. According to the Vedic standards, it may not be the ideal situation. And sometimes there's reasons for that. But we do the best we can. Because Just because you um, start a race badly, it doesn't mean you can't finish first. So, okay, it's not ideal, but we can bring in more elements by looking and reading and studying the example of Kadama Bini and Devahuti. That means that for the woman, she's, she's trying to be pleasant, she's trying to serve, she's trying to become Krishna conscious, and the man also trying to be sense controlled, not trying to exploit her, and also trying to be Krishna conscious. And then you do the best you can according to the situations that, that you're in. That's it. That's all you can do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You talked about the parameters for choosing uh, a partner in the Vedic system. Can you please contrast it with uh, the present day situation? What are the parameters? What are the considerations for relationship? And 
Ahí está, un superior. Ok. Thank you very much. <coughs> so then, you allow me to at least bring up some of the points that I couldn't go into so much detail with based on the different types of marriages. So the parameters for the, let's go for the, let's start with the Vedic system. For example, if cleanliness was very important to a family, one thing they would do is because it was, there was a sense of community, you'd have uh, a representative of the family like the parents visit the home of the groom and at a certain point they'd open up the ki a kitchen drawer, look at the back of a spoon and see whether it's dirty or not. Why? The point is that if somebody has a certain standard of cleanliness, they'll always make sure that the back of the spoon is very clean. So they'll look at that and then, and then they'll be able to match and see whether this family has a certain level of cleanliness and use that as one of the factors to base their decisions on. So the Vedic actually starts with ourselves. It starts with knowing how much how the qualities that we have, the, level, the type of character and nature that we have, and also the level of maturity that we have. And then from that, then you make the appropriate match. So the parameters, like I was sharing before in the presentation, was that there was an equal level of maturity, character and qualities. Then, physical attraction, generally that's not, you don't need to cultivate that, that will just come. Because if there's a certain level of compatibility, Krishna says that we get attached to anything that we associate with. So by associating with somebody who's compatible, we become attached to somebody who's compatible. Then, it can, then there's some harmony. In the modern system, like I was recently saying that uh, you had a couple who met each other on a radio station, came together in a radio studio, and within five minutes they were married. So the consideration of character, qualities, maturity, generally is not, generally is not observed. What they generally tend to consider, from what I've observed in my own bar and city, is it's made on beauty, material assets, material wealth, and if they're into the same, you know, like, same movies and same external activities. Now, to finish, to conclude your question, the reason why the Vedic system is more superior than the modern system is because the modern system, if a relationship is just based on mutual attraction, at, last it, at, at best it will last three years. Unless they have some good, great karma that even whoever they chose, it allows them to have a good relationship. Whereas the Vedic used the conditioning of each person, which is not going to change anytime soon, and match that. And in that, in that way, uh, the relationship lasted. Can you repeat that? No problem. The last person. Yeah. In the Vedic system, they would match the conditioning. Because unless, <clears throat> unless our chanting is incredibly, incredibly deep, generally it will take many years for our conditioning to shift and change. So they will take the conditioning and make sure that it was matched so that, they can, uh, so that the relationship was would, would last. I just read a paper just the day before yesterday with Dalba the center for the worries, it doesn't matter, it's just for Yeah, sure, sure. So Prabhupada has gone to great length in explaining different uh, male-female psychology. In Canto 3, chapter 23, verse 2, Prabhupada says that the man and woman psychology are different. If it wasn't necessarily, if it wasn't necessary to consider the psychology, Prabhupada wouldn't write that in his purpose. Now sometimes Prabhupada uses the word devotees to mean sadhakas and sometimes devotees to mean in the pure state. So from what I understand of a purple I believe I've read similar to yours, that to the extent that we identify as a devotee and to the extent that we act and think and speak in a devotional mood with a devotional attitude, to that extent 
we're above our conditioning, and then that doesn't need to be considered as much. But to the extent that we identify with our conditioning, to that extent, we need to take that into consideration. Is that, is that clear? Yeah, my uh, question is, um, in Kali Yuga, people are more materialistic and they, uh, their parameters for choosing a life partner is completely different from what we are presenting. So how are we going to bring this knowledge, how are we going to bring them to understand this and use it for their own advantage or to their own advantage? Okay, thank you very much for that question. So, we can address that in a few different ways. One is, first of all, you need to determine whether you're dealing with somebody who is civil or somebody who is uh, irrational. Because it doesn't matter how many arguments we present to someone who is irrational, it won't work we'll be wasting our time, time that could be used in, in other ways for proper service. Now, we're dealing with somebody who's rational. The next question is that, if, you think of, if we think about all the different types of activities and events that a person can go through, the ones that are going to hurt them the most and please them the most are their relationships. You can have someone who doesn't really have a very good job, but if he or she has very strong relationships, then they can be happy. Whereas you can have somebody who's very rich, very, uh, yeah, is well to do, but doesn't have great relationships, they're going to suffer. One of the things that um, a famous actor, Tom Hanks, mentions is that I wish that people can become rich to realize actually there's nothing there. So just the material considerations is not going to work. If somebody can accept that, that relationships make or break them, then we can move on to the next stage. And we appeal to their intellect, we appeal to their intelligence. Krishna consciousness is presenting intellectual arguments and intellectual reasons to uh, show that the process <coughs> and the lifestyle is more superior to what they live in now. So we can present intellectual reasons to the audience that are acceptable non-fanatic, and it's for their best interests. And in that way, from what I've seen, at least in my own preaching over the last six years, that if Krishna conscious arguments are presented in a reasonable, factual way, there, there's no problem with um, accepting it because they're universal. <clears throat> it may be different to what they are doing now, but we can, they can factually, they'll be able to factually see and perceive that it's in their best interest. So that's what I found works for me by presenting very good reasons that are irrefutable, it goes to their intelligence. Okay, your time is up.